All right, we are recording, so everything you say or do may be used against you. I can't guarantee it. Um, and Prashant will probably distribute this somehow after. Yeah, we have a uh, Bay Area YouTube channel. Uh, it's called OWASP Hacker Thursdays. Uh, we will be uh, uploading in, in, on that channel. Cool. Great. We'll give everyone a few more minutes. You definitely lose the uh, the pre-talk pizza and beverage kind of moments during the Zoom Zoom meetups. I am excited to get back to meeting with real people again someday. Hey, Jimmy, <clears throat> Terrence Runger, Realtio. How's it going? Good, good. We're a Sig Sai customer. Really Sweet. like the product. Awesome. That's good to hear. Yep. Um, I, I, I work there, but I get I, I know the OWASP thing, and my slides have the little logo, but this is, I promise this is not a Sig Sai focused talk. Um, but I'm glad to hear that you enjoy the product. I enjoy yep. I like working on it. Yep. yep. Hey, hi, Terence. This is Prashant here. How are you? Hey, Prashant. What's happening? <laughs> Long time. Yeah. Uh, everything okay with you? Uh, other than being stuck in Texas, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it's pretty good. <laughs> uh, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. Good, good. I've got uh, Dimitri from my team on as well. So, what about. company were you at, Terrence? Is that right? What company? I'm at Reltio, R-E-L-T-I-O. We're based in Redwood Shores, but I've got a global team. I've got people across the country as well as Bulgaria and Russia. So it's uh, pretty pretty distributed. Yeah, yeah. But I miss uh, being able to get out to California, and I miss seeing Prashant as well. <laughs> so. Yeah, I was on a – I don't live in California anymore, but I was on – basically every month I'd go for a week and – not anymore. So here we are. Where are you now? I live in Flagstaff, Arizona, which oh, okay. I'm very happy about. So yeah, not, that's not, not too bad. No. So, yeah, no, we love it. So it's, uh, but just different times. Yeah. Well, Pr Prashant, don't burn up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the fires are just like 10 miles from my house. Oh, wow. Well, that's that's going to be bad air quality. Yeah. Uh, all right, Jimmy. Let's get started. Yeah, let's do it. You, yeah. you can uh, you can take the intro, Prashan. Sure. All right. Uh, good morning, folks, uh, and good evening, and um, um, to uh, everybody from other parts of the world. My name is Prashant. Uh, I am part of the Uwas Area chapter. I try to organize this uh, hacker days. Um, we have been fortunate that Jimmy has spoken um, at this event a couple of times. Um, the, his last talk on Kubernetes was a huge success and it was like really appreciated by everyone. Uh, he is one of the DevSecOps guru uh, we look forward to. I, uh, I mean, attend his meetups and um, his blogs. So I would encourage um, uh, you guys to check out the work, what he's doing. So over to you, Jimmy. Let's get started. Cool. Thank you very much. I appreciate the intro. Um, yeah, happy to be back in this uh digital online format. Uh, I was just saying I definitely miss being on site and, and meeting people. Uh, last year, uh, I, I looked at my Marriott app and I had almost 150 nights in hotels. And this year, it'll be like three. And that's happened right before COVID. So it's a much different time, but um, still nonetheless doing the same thing. Uh, talking about Kubernetes, pretty much uh, nothing's changed. So uh, without further ado, we'll just uh, get rolling. So um, we're going to, I'll full screen this for everyone. Um, I'm going to be bouncing around a little bit, doing some demos, doing some stuff. Uh, let's just try to keep this meetup style. I know it's whatever time, 11 o'clock for me um, and wherever you are in the world. Um, but if you have questions, use chat. 
chime in. Let's let's talk. There's plenty of time uh, for all of that. So um, Neil already has our, our first question of the day. The standard opening question, will the slides be, be available later? The answer is absolutely. Um, and so will I. So I love talking to people about tough problems, even if I don't have the answer uh, on AppSec, DevOps, uh, Kubernetes, whatever. Uh, so I'm available too, and the slides will be, and we're recording as well. So uh, we'll post that up on the um, YouTube channel. So uh, before I start, uh, well, yeah, before I start, um, there's a very, very new OWASP project that uh, is going to be coming out and we'll need some feedback and pull requests and, and lots of all that fun stuff uh, called the Kubernetes Security Cheat Sheet as part of the OWASP Cheat Sheet series. So this is an OWASP meetup. Um, yeah, so check it out. It's not published yet and you'll, you'll find in the GitHub repo, there's a drafts folder. It, it'll be in there very shortly, but I'm working with some others to get a lot of this stuff down in a formalized manner for in the OWASP consumable fashion uh, to do Kubernetes security better. So uh, I'm really excited about it. I think it's gonna uh, be a really cool project. So check that out. Um, and yeah, let's uh, talk about containers and Kubernetes. So who am I? That's not important. Uh, what's important uh, is uh, we, we discuss container security, uh, at least at the basic uh, fundamental level, because if you're not familiar with Kubernetes or if you've just dabbled with it, it's a container orchestrator, right? So um, we're going to have to use containers to run Kubernetes. Now, uh, Kubernetes has become a very hot topic. It's very complex. There's a lot going on. We can talk uh, philosophy and the future and all that stuff also if you're interested and um, I, I love that stuff so but at, at its core we're going to talk about the Linux kernel a little bit and containers and then go through the layers I think we have like seven layers for this uh, kind of topic to talk about Kubernetes specifically starting at the kernel ending at our public cloud provider um, and uh, we are going to do a little demo. I work for a company called Signal Sciences. This, uh, I, I just want to make it clear, this is not a vendor pitch by any means. You'll see the logo and stuff. It's no uh, secret that I work there. I do, I'm the head of security research, but we're going to talk Kubernetes and we're going to peek into the tool to just see some interesting West uh, web inspection uh, kind of requests, what they look like inside of Kubernetes and some of the layer seven research that I'm excited about um, uh, inside of the cluster. So not a vendor pitch. I know that's, that's not what anybody came for. So, uh, but I love our product and, and it, it does a good job at some things like that. So, um, we will have a quick demo of that. And I want to give a shout out to uh, an open source project from KubeCon last year, uh, that we'll also bring up and then Q and a as always. So, but feel free use chat. I'll, I got it open in a separate screen here, um, and uh, let's roll. So, yep, that's me, Jim Mest on Twitter. If you want to uh, find me, um, I do. Yeah, I'm the head of security research, signal sciences. That means I get to work on lots of fun things uh, with AppSec and cloud native security. And uh, yeah, so I've done a lot of training in the past. So, container security crash course. So, as I mentioned our building block in Kubernetes, uh, everyone typically wants to jump to the exciting stuff you know, of Kubernetes, but before we do that, we have to talk about containers, right? Um, I'm sure people are familiar here if you're attending this on what a container is to a degree, but we're just gonna kind of start from scratch briefly and, uh, and talk about some of the you know upsides, downsides, sideways sides of container security, what it really means to have an isolated container. Um, so, you know, typical, you know, kind of box structure slide here for every container talk. Um, containers are different than VMs. That's step one, right? Uh, we can talk about sandboxing and all that stuff later, but at its core, when you're running a Docker container or any container runtime, you do not have your own kernel, right? You are sharing the host kernel. Uh, and the kernel is the nucleus of what's going on in an operating system. 
handles, you know, device drivers, networking, um, you have all sorts of binaries, everything that you need to hook into to make your application run relies on the kernel and a VM like an EC2 instance or using VirtualBox or something on your machine, that's getting your own kernel, right? That's why it takes a little bit to boot and you have all these things available and the isolation is strong because of this uh, hypervisor layer, the software layer that we generally trust. He's in the trains. Yep. Is that a question? Or is that a, a small child? Either way, let me know. Hello to, <laughs> hello to the child if it is. I have two of them. One may come through the door anytime. Um, if you could all mute uh, while we're going, unless you have a question, that would be awesome. Um, just to, to make things flow here. Uh, so containers, we share the same kernel, right? And the same sharing the same kernel is great because this is an ap application layer construct. We really only need to worry about bundling and packaging the things our application uh, will need to run. That's it. We don't have to worry about the underlying infrastructure. The container runtime handles all of those communications to that shared kernel for us. Awesome. So uh, there is no boot. There is no, uh, uh, you know, we don't really have this full OS to deal with this boot sequence. Um, and they can be really lightweight, which is why they work really, really well in um, uh, CI/CD environments, fast-moving DevOps sort of uh, spaces. So um, application layer construct, that's an important concept. Uh, what that also means, which could bring controversy sometimes, right, is that containers aren't lightweight virtual machines. Um, that's the very common kind of elevator pitch for containers. And uh, there's so much more to it than that. So we want to kind of get away from this <laughs> virtual machine notion because VMs are different. Hey, hey, uh, sorry to disturb. Uh, you can make me the host. I will mute the person who, if he's talking. Let's do that. Oop. One second. My stuff all over the place here. Prashant may coast. All right, Prashant's on the hunt for those of us who are not on mute. Um, okay, so again, containers aren't lightweight VMs. They behave differently. They act differently. They, um, they have a different security model entirely, right? They don't have a hypervisor that we're worried about. So um, let's talk about what that means from a security perspective. So at the end of the day, Containers rely on a bunch of Linux constructs and features that have been available to the Linux kernel for a long time, right? Um, and C groups and namespaces are those two major things. Um, and all we're trying to really do at the end of the day is isolate a process from seeing another process inside of a, uh, a, a run, on a running host, right? Uh, a PID um, or a process ID. So containers do that. Docker does that and it organizes all of that for us. This isn't a new concept uh, whatsoever. So we're kind of tricking the kernel into thinking like, hey, I'm, or, or we're tricking the, the application into thinking I'm running in my own host, but really it's the uh, container runtime that's handling those system calls for us and providing isolation. So typically, if you just run a container on a machine, we're, that container runtime is going to try to restrict the number of Linux syscalls or Linux capabilities that it has. There are 300 some odd Linux uh, system calls that exist in Docker. If you just use Docker engine and kind of the Docker container runtime, uh, for example, we're going to try to shrink that, right? Reduce our attack surface. So we have this notion of isolation. Um, and that sounds great, right? That we've had containers long enough that this has been battle tested over the, the few years, uh, no, 10 years that we've been working with these things. Um, but things, oh, I got somebody drawing on the screen. That's fun. Um, but things are not always what they seem, right? Because containers provide flexibility. And flexibility uh, can mean insecurity sometimes. So when we run a regular old container uh, without any additional flags, um, and we're pulling from, you know, this particular command is pulling from the Alpine base image. Uh, and we're going to just run this libcap and cap sh, these little binaries that help us interact with the, the Linux kernel in a way where we can view and modify our capabilities. 
Um, this is kind of just to show like what's going on under the hood here. What capabilities do I even have access to? So um, this is where I'm gonna bounce around and I'm gonna pull up my terminal and I'm gonna zoom in for everyone, don't you worry. And we're just gonna run a container um, and see what these Linux capabilities are. We're not definitely not gonna go through all of them because there are quite a bit, but just keep in mind, these are the capabilities to the Linux kernel, if you will, um, that this container that is non-privileged, that doesn't have anything special, it's just Alpine from Docker Hub. Um, these are the capabilities that we have access to, right? And this is by running uh, this cap sh command. So I've installed that using this apk update and apk add um, uh, command as part of my Docker run. And I can see the capabilities on the Linux. These are the Linux system calls that I have available to me inside of this container, right? So it's shrunk down. We, we you know, Docker, uh, which I'm using Docker is this, the CRI here. Um, and this is what's available. Docker has basically said, we need this stuff um, as a running container to operate and nothing more. And this has been whittled down over the years. If you will. So uh, where problems come into play is when we actually have to start using this container, right? To do interesting things, to store data, to uh, manipulate IP tables, to uh, monitor network traffic. When you start really needing to interact with the host operating system um, and especially mounting directories or doing Docker inside of Docker, then you can, right? Container and no container runtime really cares. It gives you this ability to be flexible, right? So mounting volumes, um, completely disabling security features, running as the root user, sharing the host namespace. These are just to name a few of the things that you'll find in a typical container, right? When it's running that needs access to certain things, or maybe it doesn't and it's just people just ignored it. So um, the goal of container security is to prevent container breakout, right? That's the goal of Kubernetes security as well. I mean, amongst other things, uh, there are other attacks that can occur inside of the cluster or on the cloud environment itself, but container breakout is the most fun, right? It's it's what uh, it, it's what we want to do as an AppSec uh, professional or a bug bounty person. If you end up getting RCE or SSRF or any of our kind of more high impact web vulnerabilities to trigger in a running container inside a Kubernetes cluster, you want to break out of that container, land on the host as root, and now you're on the Kubernetes cluster node and you could do all sorts of things. We'll talk about those uh, in a little bit here, but um, to prevent container breakout, we first must understand container security and container security hygiene, right? Like what do we have to do to, to limit the scope or the blast radius of a container breakout uh, attempt? So um, first thing, probably the easiest one to uh, straight up disallow, um, awesome, we hit 90 part participants, that's good. Uh, we wanna disallow privileged containers. And why do we want to do that? Well, privileged is kind of weird. Um, I'm going to run the same command I ran before, uh, just with that Alpine image. And let's just see what this fancy little dash dash privilege CLI flag does for us in the Docker container runtime. This is very specific to Docker, but other container runtimes support this as well. So um, instead of our current capabilities, right? Again, we're not we don't need to understand all these, that's okay. This is just, these are Linux kernel system calls. So um, I don't expect anybody to be a guru of all of them, but what happens is when you run privileged, this set's a lot bigger, right? There's a lot more capabilities available to us. And if you really kind of dive into some of these, um, cap Mac admin, and we have, uh, what else do we have? Capsys time. Uh, Capsys admin. These are capabilities that are extremely dangerous, right? They they basically open up your isolated container to being a regular process on the host. I would argue that if you're running privileged containers in Kubernetes, you're not really running a container. That whole sense of isolation is just kind of gone, right? You you don't have those um, protections in place that the container runtime has given to us by the restriction of these capabilities. 
So if you want to pop a shell and you land on a, a VM or a host or a Kubernetes node or something, whatever, and there's Docker running on it, Docker is installed and configured, run this command and you will escalate to root on the host, right? On the host itself, it's pretty simple. Um, but this is just a feature of Docker. This is just a feature of any container. So um, that privilege uh, flag removes the security boundaries that you had before. Um, you can do, you can uh, use the host networking stack instead of the one that the Docker container has available to you that's isolated. You can even use the host process tree. So you can see all the processes available to you from the host perspective. Yeah. And for fun, you could just mount the host root directory. So yeah. you can mount the entire file system from the host into your container, change your root directory, and you're, you're just root, right? Like it doesn't even matter. So if I run this command locally, uh, keep in mind that I'm running Docker for Mac, which is actually running a container inside of a VM um, on my machine. So I'm going to become root on the, the host, which is the VM. It's not really my Mac OS uh, hardware or my Mac OS operating system. Um, so if we run this, and I, I, I encourage you, uh, to, if you're legally allowed to be testing some box somewhere and Docker is running, just, just run it, right? Like if you've, if you've ever used the command prompt, this is a pretty good sign, right? Who am I? Root. Uh, where am I? I don't know. It'll probably just drop me into the root directory. So yeah, here from this, uh, this slash directory. So right now, by running that Docker run as privileged and using all of the hosts features and networking, and I've also mounted the host directory of that VM into my container. Yeah, I'm in the container. That's true, but it doesn't matter. I have read, write, full, full root access to everything on this host VM, right? So this is a problem. Um, and this is the problem in Kubernetes as well, because all of these things that are available to us in Docker are also available to us inside of the Kubernetes ecosystem. The API supports this. The, it's just a container runtime uh, on a virtual machine at the end of the day. So on to the fun stuff. Kubernetes. So uh, we're not going to do an intro to Kubernetes. Uh, we don't have time. If you are, there's a lot of that out there in the world. So you can go find that. Um, so basically, when we need to run a container, API, some backend service, whatever, and we need to deploy it to some sort of uh, VM or machine, right? We need to serve traffic and do things. Uh, Kubernetes has now become the most popular way to do this, right? It's how we orchestrate containers. Uh, it does a lot more than that. Uh, the scaling and secrets and configuration and all sorts of crazy stuff, right? Like if you follow the Kubernetes news, now AWS has a Kubernetes controller that lets you write a Kubernetes manifest and create an S3 bucket. Uh, inside of AWS, uh, the, the security uh, isolation and boundaries that existed are just bleeding out into the entire cloud ecosystem. Your whole public cloud can be configured and accessed and managed from the Kubernetes control plane, which is a whole different talk, a whole different discussion that's um, really cool and it sounds awesome for usability and something to brag about, but we don't even totally understand the security ramifications of some of these things quite yet. Uh, so we'll start at layer zero, the kernel itself, right? Uh, this is at the center. This is as uh, close as we can get to, you know, the source of truth as possible. And um, we need to make sure the kernel, which is shared by a bunch of pods inside of a Kubernetes node, um, is locked down as much as it can be, right? Uh, oftentimes when you're using managed Kubernetes, you're choosing maybe uh, some sort of uh, OS or base image that is given to you from your cloud provider. And they're, they're gonna do a lot of this stuff for you. Um, still worth checking out and understanding what's going on. System calls, right? We have to restrict system calls um, if you want to really have an isolated environment. And you can even do uh, a plus one on that by introducing additional sandboxing techniques such as GVisor, Cata Containers. Um, these are really cool projects, right? Because 
the idea, uh, I, would, I would even throw a firecracker, AWS firecracker uh, in, into this sort of mix. But the idea here is that we're gonna build a shim or a lightweight VM, depending on if you use GVisor or Kata, to actually restrict these system calls even further, isolate the container, make the container look a lot more like a VM um, and give you this limited blast radius. Uh, uh, it would reduce the kernel abuse that could happen um, in a regular running uh, container. So check those projects out. GVisor is uh, basically a kernel proxy written in Go that takes your system calls and supports many, well, lots of them, strips them down and talks back to the kernel um, and only talks to the kernel with about 20 or so system calls. It really reduces your attack surface. If you've ever used Google Cloud Run, um, that uses GVisor under the hood because it's super multi-tenant, super scary place uh, to run untrusted code. And uh, patch your stuff, right? Kernel vulnerability comes out and you're rolling your own cluster uh, on bare metal or something, that's on you. Um, you don't want kernel vulnerabilities or container breakout vulnerabilities like we saw with the run C uh, CVE that came out last year, that's, that's game over. Um, regular web attack uh, can turn into full cluster and maybe even full cloud compromise at, at that point. So the container itself, right? Uh, going up the stack a little bit. So container security at rest uh, is really about reducing the attack surface early in your, your Docker image or your container image itself. How you build the container or how you build the image is, is really important, right? You don't want to pull in every package under the sun. You don't always want to use from Ubuntu latest uh, because it just has a bunch of stuff that is, is going to be very, very convenient for attackers if they have a shell or have RCE or SSRF, you know, you name it. Um, you want to really limit the, the, uh, the tools available to the, the, if, uh, in the event of a compromise. So um, check out your, your, your image build and use a lightweight base image, distro list, you know, we see Alpine, uh, whatever works uh, for your particular use case, but make sure it's the bare minimum, right? Principle of least privilege. Scan, for Im scan your images for vulnerabilities. Um, everyone recommends that all the time, but it's a thing, you, you should do it. It makes uh, for a healthy, end-to-end uh, -end, uh, kind of image pipeline and pull images from known good sources, right? Don't, don't pull images from Docker Hub blindly. That's uh, not a thing we should be doing in the year 2020. Uh, we need to have our own vetted uh, integrity checked image registry that we're trusting to pull images to production, et cetera, into your environment. Um, and then integrity, right? Attackers don't always go after Kubernetes at, at the runtime step, right? I, I would go after Jenkins, you know, if you have a, a, a crusty old Jenkins box, Jenkins box sitting somewhere, probably a good chance it's not patched. They're using a bunch of really sketchy plugins. So um, you could totally manipulate the image build and inject your own Bitcoin miner or some reverse shell or some vulnerable package, whatever. Um, so you're going to have to check the integrity at every step of the CI CD build process. Uh, at runtime. So um, we've built the image, we've, we've submitted uh, our request to the API server. API server is going to go talk to uh, Kubelet and the Kubelet's going to you know, invoke the uh, container runtime, something like Docker, and it's going to say, okay, Docker run, let's run this thing, put this container in a running state. Um, so what can we do from a security perspective there? So uh, number one, we shouldn't be execing into containers or uh, really modifying containers at a, in a running state anyways, or even have the tools available to us to do that. Uh, so check out a uh, Kubernetes feature called ephemeral containers. They uh, just what ephemeral means. They kind of come and go uh, and they hook into a container and that's in runtime state and you can debug in that uh, particular state and inside of a, a cluster. That's pretty cool feature that's kind of in later versions of Kubernetes. Um, and uh, hook, and, and you can look for anomalies. So tools like Sysdig, Falco, right? Like I want to know if somebody spawned a shell in a container, or I want to know if somebody had a read operation with, you know, Etsy pass, Etsy shadow or something like that, a very sensitive file. And uh, you can do that uh, by hooking into the container 
and use tools like eBPF to actually watch the Linux system calls that are happening. And remember, that's the source of truth. And uh, we can stop this stuff or at least be notified of it to go you know, sound the alarms that there's actually something happening, right? So we can hook into the container and watch for system level events that could indicate compromise. So uh, pod security context, this is where you have control as an operator or security person to kind of define the security parameters of a given uh, pod or a given workload inside of the cluster. So understanding these is pretty important, right? So this is where I define if I want my pods to be privileged or a particular container to be privileged inside of that uh, pod, what groups and, and UIDs this, this container or pod will use. Um, you can drop or add uh, capabilities or Linux uh, system calls explicitly through the pod security context. All of our mandatory access controls like right, SecComp, AppArmor, ST Linux, they're defined here as well. So if you have a team that's good with SE Linux and AppArmor and you want to use these things, and you have uh, good policies in place, you can put them here. Um, file system permissions, uh, privilege escalation. So all, thing, all the things that a security operator would care about um, or want to be notified about, these are bad things also. They happen here at the pod security context. So they look like this, uh, not terribly exciting, some YAML, here's a pod. Uh, and uh, you know the interesting thing is the security context uh, stanzas can be applied to either the pod level or the con individual containers inside of a pod. Um, for a refresher, uh, a pod is just a collection of containers, right? So you don't always have one, you could have two, you can have five or 10, it doesn't matter. So these security contexts can be applied um, to the containers or the actual pod. And here's where we define our user, some additional uh, uh, capabilities for the kernel itself. Um, and different user defined down in this particular container, right? And that is actually interesting because that overrides the pod spec. So you got to look at this. If you're, if you're serious about securing your Kubernetes cluster, you got to understand what these things mean and what people are requesting or uh, build systems are requesting or, or your pipeline, whatever it is. However, this YAML gets here, um, you're going to have to put some defense in place and understand the request that's coming in. How do we do that in an automated fashion? Uh, we don't read every YAML file, uh, hopefully. We put tools in place, right? I would call these like pod security context firewalls or something, right? So uh, number one, pod security policy, PSPs. These are available to us out of the box from Kubernetes. Um, it's part of the API server. And it's basically going to inspect every workload that's incoming that's uh, to the cluster itself and going to make some decisions based on rules that you have built. Uh, and PSP has been around for a while. Uh, it's not really actively worked on uh, because it's kind of been taken over by what, what we call OPA, right? Open Policy Agent. Uh, Open Policy Agent does all the things that PSP can accomplish and, and a lot more and it's much more flexible. So if you want to build um, strict or not strict, but uh, logical and uh, a reasonable policies uh, for what you allow inside of your cluster and what you ex explicitly disallow. OPA, PSP, all those things can help you and um, you can get really granular and say, I don't want any containers inside of any pods to run as root. I, I explicitly disallow uh, mounting, read, read write uh, of the host directory into a running container. I don't want uh, users, groups to be X, Y, Z, like you can do whatever you want here. And uh, OPA will let you do that in a more sophisticated, flexible way than PSP would traditionally. So networking, um, pods can talk to other pods, right? That's pretty important when you have uh, this microservices architecture that everybody wants you to be running now. It's really, really important that, you know, all these different backends can communicate with one another. But it's also really important that some of them can't, right? It, it isn't a free for all that we shouldn't have a flat network where every single pod inside of your production Kubernetes cluster can talk to every single other pod. Um, that just opens you up to all sorts of problems. And, uh, and we didn't really allow that in the past, but Kubernetes doesn't give us any sort of protections out of the box. We have to go build these things. And that usually means implementing a couple different technologies. So 
Um, the problem here, again, if you compromise a container inside of a pod, what are you gonna do as an attacker? You're probably gonna try to pivot, or you're, you're gonna uh, poke around uh, and see, you know, where am I? Am I in a Kubernetes cluster? Am I in ECS? Am I on some VM and EC2? Like, what's going on here? So I'm gonna kind of port scan and, and feel my way around so I'm, I can pivot, right? Um, and pivoting is what you probably wanna do. You wanna go steal data, you wanna pivot somewhere else, you can install your cryptocurrency miner, whatever your end goal is. Um, RCE, SSRF is how you can do that. Um, and the other kind of scary part is you can pivot to the Kubernetes API from the inside, right? Let's say you've locked down your cluster, you don't allow API access from the outside of the world. I'm just gonna RCE or get a reverse shell in this running container and I'm gonna go talk to your API server directly from the inside, right? Which is kind of hard to detect, kind of hard to, uh, to prevent um, in some scenarios and that's gonna lead to serious issues if you compromise the API server. Uh, egress traffic. So this is traffic originating from a container inside of a pod. It's gonna go reach out from the inside out to an IP address on the internet or something, right? Uh, that's, that's scary, right? If that happens and you're not expecting it and you're getting random connections to uh, very suspicious IP addresses or domain names, this is cryptocurrency mining like 101. You gotta have your exploit, you, you plant something, then you're gonna go do a W get to grab your cryptocurrency miner, your binary, and that event right there, uh, you have to block. I mean, you have to at least uh, be watching for those things. So uh, networking is not super straightforward in Kubernetes and it's kind of really up to the operator on how to, uh, how to tackle this. So a uh, few different defenses, uh, strict network controls, right? Like network policies are, are built for us inside the Kubernetes. It's a standard Kubernetes API object to kind of build these different uh, policies out in a more granular fashion. Uh, and you know, which pod can talk to which pod or which namespace can talk to another namespace. All those can be accomplished through network policies. Um, service mesh, uh, it's the talk of the town for the last two years. It's great, yeah, like you can totally do all of your networking security um, and, and everything and then some uh, using a service mesh. You can really get granular with how you wanna control traffic between different services, uh, ingress and egress. So um, in this last note, right, like don't mix dev, test and prod together. It's gonna end poorly outside of networking even like um, you don't want to rely on network policies or namespaces or your service mesh to just like prevent something bad happening if you're running dev um, inside of uh, inside of the same cluster as prod. So I have a question from James. Um, that's my name too. Cheers. Uh, does Istio improve network security? It can. Yeah, you got to build the policies. Um, you have to understand uh, what, you know, what does network segmentation look like in your cluster? What should talk to another um, workload? What shouldn't? So if you put the work in, it can. If you don't put the work in, um, it won't. So it's, it's totally uh, up to you. Uh -oh. Thank you. Just got, totally just got a cupcake delivery from my two-year-old son. That's, can't beat that. Um, so uh, there, yeah, Istio's fine, right? But Istio is a very complicated project full of its own security problems itself. Um, so just be mindful, right? Like network policies can probably solve 99% of your your security needs, maybe Istio, you need MTLS or something and that's that's what you bring in Istio for. Um, you're gonna wanna understand what's going on under the hood, at least to some degree with Istio before you dive uh, head first. Uh, so SSRF, server-side request forgery, awesome web attack, we see it all the time, go on HackerOne, do that activity reports and you're gonna see people just raking in money with SSRF, uh, it's great. Uh, but it's gotten popular, I think, because cloud native stuff is really good to hit with SSRF because we've kind of put 
everything in this Kubernetes box and said, well, it's on the inside. We're kind of just going to have this flat network. Um, we can talk to cloud metadata endpoints, other IP addresses inside of the um, inside of my VPC, whatever, right? So um, once you kind of compromise a container, you can get to a lot of places, right? So SSRF is uh, all over the place, but if you want to try to find this stuff, um, we see a lot in build systems, right? Like Circle CI style things, not saying Circle CI inherently vulnerable, but like that concept of, of being able to run untrusted code, uh, customer provided webhooks, site previews, that kind of stuff. If you're a bug bounty hunter, you already know this. Like you, you, you look there first for SSRF, right? Um, and really all you're trying to do with SSRF is force that uh, compromised container to make an internal network call or maybe not even internal, it can reach back out to the internet. Um, so you're kind of kind of RCE, remote code execution-esque, uh, where you're just making a network call from the inside. But you can turn these things into full-blown like pen testing uh, network scanners, right? Like scanning the Kubernetes network from the inside is very eye-opening and that things will light up like a Christmas tree. Um, hitting the cloud metadata endpoint Right, Capital One style, uh, we've all seen this. Uh, uh, 169.254, 169.254, uh, that's the AWS one. You hit that, you maybe get some creds and some metadata and you are on your merry way, right? So uh, same with Kubernetes metrics endpoint. There's lots of stuff you can hit from the inside through SSRF that you would never really have access to from the general internet. So it's a very pretty scary vulnerability. Again, we see this all over the place. Uh, it's great, right? Like SSRF is just um, littered all over HackerOne, so you can read up on that. Uh, so uh, remote code execution, right? So same vein, uh, but really dangerous. You're running OS level commands inside of the container uh, that's compromised inside of Kubernetes. So these happen in file uploads, uh, image magic style image man manipulation tools, third party libraries, like poorly written, web applications, uh, we see this all the time. Uh, and this can be, this can range from benign to total cloud compromise. Uh, and you can dump sensitive data, you can get to the Kubernetes API, you can have a lot of fun with RCE or our kind of a reverse shell, if you will, too. Um, so we have to be really mindful of this. If you can run commands on the container, it kind of starts at that image integrity, right? The, the base image, if you have nothing available other than a single binary inside of that container and you block egress and you have all these different controls in place, they're not going to be able to install their, their, their fun hacker tools, their Kali Linux stuff to go uh, kind of poke around and have fun because there's nothing there that, that's such a, a bare um, environment to be in. Uh, and those protections are going to really uh, work over time, you know, to prevent people from pivoting out. So uh, layer seven protection interesting to me right uh beyond because i work for signal sciences that's kind of our thing but um i've done appsec for a long time and then kind of went into this kubernetes thing uh for better or worse i don't know but um that that marriage of the two uh becomes like a really uh interesting research study right uh layer seven we're talking web attacks uh from the outside of the world in which i would call north south right typical kind of coming from the internet through a proxy, hits the application server, whatever, and you're monitoring that um, and you're attacking. But there's some interesting use cases for east-west detection. Uh, and this is an area that's, I mean, not new, but um, at least in the concept of uh, cloud native and some of these very, very tightly coupled services, uh, I find it to be, uh, a little different. So east-west uh, is, is basically pod-to-pod -pod communication or cluster-to-cluster -cluster communication, VPC to VPC, cloud-to-cloud -cloud over VPN, um, things that aren't coming from the internet in, into, your, uh, into your environment. So uh, this space is somewhat new at layer seven, uh, definitely has been around, but it's something that um, is worth talking about. So uh, I'm going to showcase a couple things here um, in this little demo. You can kind of ignore this graphic. It's a little noisy, but uh, basically the setup is um, we have a, I'm, I'm using a project 
that was open sourced from myself, uh, Peter Benjamin, Brad Giesman, and Tabby Sable, all awesome Kubernetes security people you should follow on Twitter um, and, and say thank you to. Uh, this is at securekubernetes.com. This was our, uh, we gave a 90 minute workshop at KubeCon last year um, when we could do it in person. It was insane, it was like um, quite a thrill. Uh, but this setup, and, and this is, you know, we still maintain this, um, and this setup is uh, uh, pretty good to demonstrate some of these east-west sort of attacks or this uh, container breakout. We're not even going to go into the different scenarios. If you have questions on this or you want to, you know, a lot of people still roll this out internally for training themselves. It's totally step by step. But I have it set up in um, GCP here, so. Uh, I'm using uh, GKE with the two uh, single node cluster. All the stuff from our workshop is all set up. Um, I'll just show you what's. So basically what's happening here is uh, the scenario is mid-sized company has some Kubernetes cluster and somebody got a reverse shell inside of a, a container running on that cluster or RCE or they left the dashboard open. Whatever the case is, the entry point isn't as important uh, for the demo as, as the fact that we actually have uh, a shell. And that shell is right here. And that shell needs to be refreshed. So this is really cool um, as a learning tool, right? So this is a, um, uh, basically an interactive CLI. Uh, we'll call it an exposed uh, network utility dashboard to the internet. But Attacker got it, they have a shell, they're not root, that's okay, that's not important for this particular example, but um, we have the ability to go run commands, right? And that's that's kind of the, the setup of this, this demo. So um, yeah, before you all go to this uh, particular site, it is uh, password protected to prevent some of the uh, nefarious things that anybody on the Zoom could be doing to my IP address. Uh, so, uh, but if you sp spin this up yourself, you will be forced to password protect it also, but you'll see. So um, basically what we're gonna do, like really quick, I, I, you know, I just compromised this container and uh, I wanna see where I'm at, right? So maybe I'll do, I'll do an NS lookup and I'll do that and then I'll do, uh, Let's see if I have something called API in this particular cluster, right? Here we see um, Kubernetes has kind of runs its own DNS. So here we see this thing called api.prd.svc.cluster.local. Um, and what we're seeing here is basically I have a service inside of Kubernetes. I'm in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, I'm just going to assume as the attacker, I, I know that by now I've went through those commands. Um, and this is the namespace I'm in, this PRD. So maybe that's prod. And uh, this is my service name. So I'm going to go talk to this thing, right? Um, I want to attack this from the inside, right? This isn't coming from the internet anymore. This is originating from the compromised container. So let's, uh, since I'm a, a true a true hacker, I only know how to use Nmap. If, if there's somebody that's not on mute, if you could uh, kindly go on mute, please, that would be great. Um, I'm gonna, since I'm an ultimate hacker, going to use Nmap, right? Uh, the best, the best uh, uh, scanning tool there is. So I'm going to use Nmap, and I'm going to assume this is an API. So I'm going to run this little uh, Nmap uh, the script HTTP three and in, um, Typing's hard today, and I'm going to give it this IP address. So, this is my like total noob pivot attempt, right? I'm going to try to find an HTTP vuln in this a API that's only accessible from the inside. That 10. IP address is not right. That that's actually not open to the internet, anyways, um, in this cluster. So, I compromised the container, pivoted from the inside, and now I'm going to do my reconnaissance, if you will. Uh, from the inside. So this is an east-west attack, right? Um, 
yes, the initial entry point could have been a tainted container image or, or a, a, some sort of vulnerability there. Could be a malicious insider that only has restricted access. Could be a bunch of things, but maybe for whatever reason, we didn't detect it from the north uh, south perspective, but from east west, and this is where I will bring in a quick little uh, signal sciences dashboard just to show you all what this would look like from kind of uh, the detection uh, perspective. So if I refresh this, the, um, I have some special rules built. Um, I'll go to an old one. It, 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 it'll take the scan still running. So I'll just pull this one I did right before the talk. So um, I have some special rules built, right? Inside of my uh, uh, kind of next gen WAF and signal sciences. And the cool thing is that my agent is sitting on this API as a sidecar container. So I have my API that's located, that scan's done, that's good. My API is located here. Um, uh, and it's called api.prd.service.cluster.local. And if I look at what's going on there, an attacker wouldn't have access to this, obviously. Um, I have, it's this one right here. So this isn't the service name, but there's two containers running in this particular pod, right? And one of those is the signal sciences agent, right? This is how we detect malicious traffic coming from the inside. So I my attack got routed through through SIGSI. Um, and what's cool is that I have all these um, custom rules that I built to kind of say like, hey, if I see this thing that we call attack tooling, that's a built-in system signal for us. If I see this and I see it originating from the inside, insta-block, right? Like that that's never gonna be a good thing when Nmap's running uh, from a, a container and hitting uh, the inside of another container uh, that, that's in a different pod, right? So um, these rules I built, but this is the kind of stuff that we're really looking into where it's like, there's a lot of signals that can happen that are, are really bad, right? If this happened to me, I'd likely want to be like pager duty integration, like to my phone in the middle of the night, right? Cause like something, something's up. Uh, somebody got a shell somewhere and is running this east west scenario um, to my given uh, my uh, internal API. So there's all the new stuff that just came in. So, um, and you can like look at these requests in detail as well. So um, I think that's pretty cool. And that's a pretty powerful thing. And that's an area that uh, we're really kind of, I'm particularly interested in that, that kind of like what's going on on the inside. If you could watch the traffic going to the API server, um, there's just uh, things that could could be circumvented uh, to get to that point that you didn't detect and then you did later, and it's a strong indicator of compromise. So really quickly, nodes, Kubernetes opens tons of ports. Watch out, don't open stuff to the internet. Uh, please don't open your nodes themselves to the internet. You don't need SSH. You know, harden these nodes. Uh, there's a lot going on, and they're really important to just have standard kind of CIS benchmarky sort of uh, systems hardening guidelines in place. And then cluster components. Again, a whole nother probably four hour talk. Uh, we're not going to go into this is the this is the, the the breadth first approach. But the API server, how you store secrets, vulnerable components, kubelet misconfigurations, right? Like. What do you have in place for webhooks, um, public network access, VPC kind of architecture, RBAC, another talk, right? Like that's difficult to get perfectly correct. Um, who can do what? Like service account tokens. What's going to be accessing the Kubernetes API from the inside? Do you have audit logs enabled? Where are they sent? Are you doing things with them? Um, if you have questions on this stuff, we'll talk later, but there's the, the list is huge here. Um, and then the public cloud itself, right? Kind of our, our, our biggest layer, I guess layer seven would be the, the human, but we're not gonna talk about uh, the operator, but the public cloud, uh, what, you know, what build systems are talking to the cluster? Do you allow the cluster to reach out and be authenticated to IAM to spin up S3 buckets? Um, what encryption do you have in place? Base operating systems, like the list, public cloud security is definitely its own humongous topic 
that we're not going to go into in great detail, but it is kind of that next layer, right? Because Kubernetes is not really this standalone thing anymore. It is very, very integrated with cloud provider stuff, IAM, secrets, all those things kind of work very closely with the Kubernetes API and the controllers to give you this really flexible experience. It's great, but you want to be really careful from a security perspective that your blast radius doesn't become your entire public cloud. Uh, big checklist, you'll have the slides, you can read this later. I want to leave plenty of time for Q&A. Um, but these are just things you could ask yourself, right? And this is not everything. This is just some stuff off the top of my head. Uh, uh, there's other Kubernetes security luminaries out there that have a lot more to offer in this space. Um, and But you should have answers to some of these questions, right? Uh, because they're important as a, from a security perspective, if you can't answer them or you're kind of hand waving your way through them, um, maybe you should, you know, reconsider. Uh, maybe you should uh, uh, go through the effort to lock down Kubernetes itself. And another question, James's do rule, that's right. Uh, where can we access the slides? Um, they'll be sent out after, uh, probably, yeah. They'll be sent out probably in the meetup. I would guess. Um, uh, Prashant can help me with that, but I'll just send a link to the Google Slides. Uh, we have a, a slide share channel. Uh, I will uh, post it there. And also, uh, we have a YouTube channel. The talk will be available there. Sweet. Yeah, yeah. And on the YouTube channel as well. Um, so, with that, I'm just going to open it up for the last five minutes for some QA. Some, you can't actually throw things at me on Zoom, but you can, I don't know, tell me tell me that you loved it or hate it or, or whatever you want. Um, but I'm going to go through some of these, uh, some of these questions we got going on. So let's see. Let me stop my share. So you can all see my lovely COVID hairdo. Um, thanks for sharing. Uh, KubeCon NA, we can follow the instructions to learn. Yeah, the, the securekubernetes.com not just to toot my own horn, I, like we put a ton of work into that and it's, it's really cool. I think if you're like remotely interested in Kubernetes security, you can follow them things step by step in, G, uh, in GCP for free, right? Everyone gets 300 bucks with a Gmail account um, when you sign up for GCP, spin it up, do your thing, you know, learn, right? That like, it, I think more people need to be aware of what's going on inside the Kubernetes from a security perspective. You can see we gave out stickers. It's my other laptop. That's from the KubeCon. Uh, if, you, if you completed all the challenges, you got that sticker. Um, I just took one of the stickers because I helped write the challenges. But, um, but yeah, uh, love the checklist. Would you know if there could be one for EKS where AWS takes care of a lot of the core security around the control plane? Um, so the Kubernetes security uh, um, cheat sheet, sorry, I forgot the name, that's coming out with OWASP will have much more than this, that checklist I just shared. It's gonna be like the, the ultimate checklist. And we're kind of still debating on whether to call out EKS, GKE, and AKS specifically. Um, it adds a lot, right? Uh, so EKS itself, yeah, like AWS is going to handle a bunch of things on the control plane side, node upgrades, Kubernetes upgrades, all that stuff. Um, and if you're new into this venture and you don't need to roll your own Kubernetes, just please don't. Like the, there's really no uh, pride anymore into like rolling your own Kubernetes unless you have to and you need that sort of uh, uh, total control over the control plane as well as the um, every node and all the components. Um, thanks for the talk. Glad you liked it. Cool sticker. Thanks. Um, have any companies adopted your checklist? I don't know. I've shared it with a bunch of companies. I doubt they've all adopted it, but I hope that they went through it at least um, and asked the hard questions. Uh, how to handle secrets, tokens, and sensitive items in Kubernetes, pod to pod. So secrets, uh, in Kubernetes, it's a long topic. They're stored in etcd, unencrypted by default. Really, this day and age, we're seeing more and more people utilize 
you know, Secrets Manager or SSM or something that your cloud provider has that's way better than shoving them into etcd. Uh, but that being said, there's still tokens in there. There's all sorts of stuff you're going to end up with in etcd. So you got to understand, um, you know, we, we have encryption available to us in etcd, but you got to go enable it. So uh, secrets are really personal and I can't answer that whole topic in two minutes. Um, uh, I missed the announcement where we'll get the slides. There'll be, uh, Prashant said there's a slide, a place where he posts the link, but it'll also be on the YouTube uh, video itself, or just hit me up on Twitter or something. Um, Cilium CNI on GCP by default. Yeah, so Cilium basically announced uh, GKE support like this week. Um, CNIs are useful. You actually have to use a CNI to some degree to use uh, network policies. So if you want to use network policies at all, you're gonna have to look at a Cilium flannel uh, calico style uh, network networking plugin to enable that sort of thing. Kubernetes won't do it for you by default. GCP better for container security compared to AWS. Uh, it, GKE, uh, Kubernetes comes from Google. We'll just leave it at that. So they do things differently. They are a little bit ahead of the curve on some things, maybe behind in others. AWS, I feel like had a little bit of a stalled start at this. Um, same same with uh, AKS and Azure, but everyone's, everyone's kind of catching up. Um, but really it's up to you to use those features. Uh, thanks for sharing, you're welcome. Um, if you're not a Kubernetes expert, you should go to the cloud, Go to the cloud hosted route. Um, yeah, <laughs> use the cloud host, use managed Kubernetes. Um, I recommend that. Do you have recommendation related to hardening images from scratch? Yeah, like distro lists or using build steps inside of your image build, um, using really lightweight images, Alpine, scan the image. Um, it's all about the, the packages you need or don't need, right? you definitely don't need SSH and all this other stuff that a lot of these big bloated images have. So just get rid of them. I'd prefer a Golang binary running on an image with nothing else, uh, no base operating system. You can totally do that. Uh, network segmentation inside of Kubernetes is a better approach to grantees, the isolate uh, perimeter isolation. You need both. So you need perimeter uh, security, hands to any VPC security, natting, all that stuff that uh, in the cloud security world, but you also need in, in, uh, pod to pod communication uh, uh, segmentation. Uh, another great talk. Yeah, cool. You were at my other meetup. That was, uh, that was fun. Um, we got to have beer there, but I do have a cupcake. Um, what is your view on using SC Linux? Uh, unless you know what you're doing, don't do it but it's there and it's very powerful. And if you have the expertise, you can, you can really, again, all these things are just the reduction of uh, the blast surface or attack surface or uh, basically. So SE Linux is definitely going to help you with that. And it's definitely been around for a while. Um, using controllers for secrets or vault and secrets management integration is a good approach. Yeah. HashiCorp has a full sidecar in it container thing that comes up and you can go talk to vault and it gets rid of the, you know, you're not just storing secrets in etcd and like, that's great. Um, same with uh, all of the cloud hosted secrets management tools. I would use something outside of etcd probably for things you really care about. Uh, any thoughts on ephemeral containers and opinions on post deployment package installs via scripts? Ephemeral containers are cool. Uh, I haven't played with them enough. I would check them out. Uh, post deployment package installs via scripts. Uh, I'd ask yourself why you need that versus having it as part of the actual container itself. You could do it. Um, I don't know what the security implications of that are off the top of my head, but um, the less packages, the better. Post deployment seems a little out of the realm of infrastructure as code. So that would be my concern where 
the stuff you're checking in in your YAML doesn't actually reflect what's going on at the runtime. So that could get out of whack and make auditing and debugging a little tricky because magic happens later in runtime where people aren't aware of it. Cool. Well, we made it. Um, only three minutes over, but uh, I I'm going to stick around. I don't, I don't have any reason to leave right this moment. Um, but if you have to drop off, uh, I understand. And uh, I'm going to go through a couple more of these questions. And uh, thank you everyone so much. This is a really good, uh, good crew. Lots of good questions going on. Um, this was great. Cool. Good. Yeah. Um, Where's the YouTube channel? Oh, post deploy via script outside of your CI CD. Um, yeah. It, it, so yeah, what CB, whoever you are, will talk to hit me up later if you got if you have specifics. Um, happy to talk. Uh, cool. Well, that looks like all the questions. Thank you all so much. Um, I love OWASP Bay Area specifically, uh, and keep an eye out for uh, the title of capability slide was confusing. Uh, fair, yeah, I'll revisit that. Um, Real-time container breakout attacks. Yeah, so there's a, uh, there's a article from JW Player Engineering um, that they posted on basically they accidentally opened up a uh, e an external uh, service type load balancer in front of uh, a network monitoring debugging tool. That tool had a dashboard. That dashboard had a little interactive shell thing that you could debug stuff with. Um, someone found it and that container was running as root and privileged. Uh, the attacker broke out of the container and install a, a Bitcoin miner, or cryptocurrency miner on the host. So yeah, it happens, definitely happens all the time. Um, cool, bit off topic, but can you share some good uh, sites or sources to learn OWASP and pen testing? Uh, yeah, the I'd go through the OWASP Bay Area um, YouTube channel. I bet there's a bunch of stuff there, like OWASP.org, there's like tons of stuff. Uh, pen testing for me, like read Hacker One reports, read bug bounty reports, like skip a bunch of the other uh, boilerplate stuff because that's what people are doing today to get paid for a living. So um, there's some interesting stuff there. Just like go to the Hacktivity page on uh, Hacker One and search for like RCE or SSRF or whatever volume you're interested in. Some of the write-ups are so-so, but some are really, really good. And um, they're not theoretical. Like Shopify is paying 25 k for uh, SSRF stuff inside of Kubernetes and it's real, right? It's like, no joke. Um, so that's where I'd go. Um, and OWASP, obviously, OWASP.org. Cool, uh, I will be on for like two more minutes and then I'm gonna end the recording. It's gonna take a little bit to process. I'll get it over and Sean will put it up on the, uh, on the YouTube channel. And uh, again, thank you everyone. It's been real. <clears throat> gonna stop sharing my video of my lovely tired face and I'm going to leave the meeting now. So cheers, bye everyone.